Good evening aspirants. Happy to meet you all in the daily Hindi news analysis brought to you by Shankara Ice Academy. Today I'll be covering the Hindi news edition dated 7th of August 2022. I have chosen these articles for discussion today. In today's discussions we'll be covering about Bishnoi movement, defense offset, China Taiwan issue and its implications, CRISPR Cas9 technology and also a new herbarium launched by the Indian government. And at the end we have a practice questions discussion session based on these discussions. Pay attention to the discussion because I'll be posting a poll question along with this video. So after viewing the analysis don't forget to attend the poll. So let's start the session. This discussion is going to be an interesting one. In this discussion we are going to see about a community. But before that let us understand what this news article says. This article gives us information about traditional water harvesting structures in western Rajasthan. See these water harvesting structures are called as nadis or talabs. This is a nadi and this is a talab. As you can see they are shallow depressions and they are used to store rainwater. The rural communities in the western Rajasthan use these shallow depressions because the state has highly fluctuating and scanty rainfall. So to solve the problem of water scarcity, they build nadis and talabs. Now according to the news article, the nadis which are in the areas of orans perform well. Here oran is nothing but a sacred groove or sacred space which is rich in biodiversity and it usually has a water body. So according to the article the nadis in the areas of orans they are performing because these orans have trees and they slow the water runoff so this in turn prevents flash floods and it also aids in percolation of water to the ground so that means orans play a crucial role in the water conservation of the area here we have seen three different terms nadis talabs and orans while writing a mains answer try to incorporate these terminologies so that your answer will stand out from others now in addition to these points the article also mentions that the local bishnoi community has worked hard to ensure the maintenance and functioning of orans and nadis and that is why we are going to see about this bishnoi community today see these bishnois are people belonging to the bishnoi sect or bishnoi faith this faith is a religious offshoot of hinduism and we can find this community in the western rajasthan especially they reside on the fringes of thar desert the point to be noted is for many centuries the main purpose of this community is to conserve the flora and fauna to protect the environment see they have fulfilled this purpose to the extent that many of them have sacrificed their lives to protect the environment we'll see how in the later part of the discussion so conserving the environment including the flora and fauna that is the biodiversity is a part and parcel of the sacred traditions of bishnois now the basic philosophy of this religion is all living things have a right to survive and share all resources now let us see briefly how this faith came into being it is said that in the 15th century jambo ji who was a resident of a village near jodhpur had a vision that the cause of drought and hardship was mainly because of people's interference with nature So after that he became a sanyasi that is a holy man and he came to be known as Swami Jambeshwar Maharaj so it is said that from then on the Vishnoi sect began Swami Jambeshwar Maharaj has laid down 29 tenets for his followers and these tenets include ban on killing of animals a ban to the felling of trees especially felling of the kejri tree is totally banned This kejri tree grows extensively in the western Rajasthan area so they not only banned the felling of this tree but in general also felling of tree was banned in the Bishnoi sect and they were even asked to avoid using of wood for cremation this is because nature's conservation was given utmost importance by this community now this is where you need to understand about the Bishnoi movement this movement has helped a lot in the conservation of biodiversity in Rajasthan Here we have to know about the sacrifice of Amrita Devi many of you have heard about this name through a story let me tell you what happened see it was 1730s at that time the maharaja of jodhpur wanted to build a new palace so wood was required for it now to procure the wood his men went to the area around the village of jalnadi to fell the trees but when amrita devi who was the resident of that village saw this that is when she saw men coming to fell the trees she immediately rushed to prevent the men and hugged the first tree 
but unfortunately the axe that was intended to fell the tree actually fell on her and she died on spot and before dying she uttered the famous couplet or the verse of bishnois this famous verse is sar saathe rook rahe to bhi sasto jaan this means a chopped head is cheaper than a felled tree so through this verse she gave more importance to the tree than to a human life and from this you can understand the importance the vishnoi community members gave to the environment now after this incident people from surrounding villages rushed to prevent the men from felling the trees and it is said that by the end of the day more than 350 villagers lost their lives now this incident was informed to the king and when he heard about this he felt sorry for the people and he even came to the village to personally apologize and in that moment he promised the bishnoi community that they would never again be asked to provide timber to the ruler he also promised that kejri tree would not be cut and also hunting will be banned near the bishnoi villages so these promises were made by the maharaja of jodhpur to the bishnoi villagers and from then on this village came to be known as the kejri so the heartland of bishnois which is the forest near jodhpur is abundant with trees and wildlife because of these sacrifice by the bishnoi community people and from then on the landscape has become greener and uh, it even houses many important uh, animals like antelopes black bucks chinkara etc all these animals are not afraid of humans often they roam near the villages eating out of the villagers hands So from this story you can understand that the Bishnois believe that human lives are a small price to pay to protect the wildlife and the forest around them. You would have heard about this community when uh, Salman Khan case was uh, in the news because this was the community which was engaged in a legal battle with the actor. So the efforts of the Bishnoi community to conserve the environment particularly the flora and fauna is what is termed as Bishnoi movement and it happened in the 1730s. Now remember this was the particular environmental conservation movement which paved way for many other movements thereafter and we learn about one such movement that happened in 1970s yes it is the chipko movement so hugging of trees first started with the bishnoi movement and continued even after the chipko movement so in this discussion we saw about the bishnois and the relationship they have with their environment and biodiversity and how all this is imbibed in their religion itself we saw about the sacrifice of amrita devi and remember the famous verse a chopped head is cheaper than a felled tree you can even start your main answer writing with this couplet okay with these points in mind now let us move on to the next discussion well china taiwan issue is again in the spotlight and this is mainly because of a recent visit of a top us official to taiwan you would have heard that ms nancy pelosi who is the speaker of united states house of representatives visited taiwan recently and her visit has caused turbulence in the china and taiwan actually china opposed her visit and this fqu article along with this profile article deals with these matters particularly the fqu talks about the recent visit of ms nancy pelosi to taiwan It also discusses why it is opposed by China and what was the response of China and it also analyzes how this visit will be impacting US China relations. But to understand these points we need to have a basic knowledge about one China policy and also the significance of Taiwan. That is why today our discussion is going to be structured in this manner first one china policy then impact of ms pelosi's visit then usa's support to independent democratic taiwan and finally we'll be ending with the implications of the visit on us china relations okay now this is the syllabus that you can link with this discussion we are going to start with one china policy see if you remember few days before we had a discussion about uh, taiwan issue and there we saw chinese civil war we saw this topic on 3rd august and there we saw the result of the civil war what was the result that chinese communist party defeated the chinese nationalist party okay two parties are there chinese communist party and chinese nationalist party here this uh, cnp is also called as kuomintang So after this defeat that is after the civil war the political leaders of this Chinese nationalist party shifted their base to Taiwan and finally the Chinese communist party the other party took control of the mainland China whereas the Kuomintang took control of Taiwan 
and because of this the mainland china sees taiwan as a breakaway territory of china and it considers taiwan as an inalienable part of mainland china because of this chinese government even believes that one day it will integrate taiwan along with the chinese mainland and after that there will be only one chinese government this is the one china principle pay attention here it is one china principle it is actually different from the one china policy see this one china principle is the official position of chinese government but on the other hand one china policy is a diplomatic acknowledgement of usa to be specific one china policy mainly concerns the acknowledgement by usa that there is only one chinese government okay and according to this policy of usa the us government will be maintaining cultural commercial and other unofficial relations with the people of taiwan that is while the us government will be engaging in uh, trade and other activities it will not be having any political ties with the taiwanese government and this has been the status quo for some time now but this status quo has been affected by ms pelosi's visit to taiwan so i hope you had a better understanding of one china principle and one china policy now let us come to the significance of taiwan you may ask whether china is aiming to incorporate taiwan into its mainland only because of one china policy or even other reasons are present the answer is both that is china has other interests also especially due to the strategic position of taiwan See, we have elaborately discussed uh, the strategic position and importance of Taiwan on 3rd August itself. Today, I am just going to discuss the highlights. See, control of uh, Taiwan is important for China because it will increase Chinese legitimacy in the South China Sea. Because after incorporating Taiwan, China can easily enforce the Nine Dash Line, and it can even realize its dream of making the South China Sea as the Chinese Lake. Once again, I'm telling you, we have discussed uh, all these points elaborately on 3rd August. So, if you have any doubt, you can visit that analysis. Now, along with this, there is also another reason for ensuring uh, control over Taiwan by China. This reason is it will help China to breach the first island line. This first island line includes the islands of Indonesia, Philippines, and Japan. See, these islands are tilted towards USA. Especially, Japan is a US ally. and they are acting as a choke point in the pacific so indirectly their support to usa curtails the movement of chinese navy freely in the pacific ocean that is why taking control of taiwan will help china to breach this first island line and there is also one another major reason which is when china takes control of taiwan it will get access to the deep water ports of taiwan so due to these reasons china is pursuing taiwan but you have to remember here that even though usa officially has the one china policy in the recent times it seems like usa is supporting taiwan through back channel even this visit of ms pelosi is proving this point so let us understand why us might support or is supporting an independent democratic taiwan the first reason is the obvious one because us favors democracy but we know that the polity in china is different from that of usa Even then China's global standing both in the economic sphere and political sphere has increased in the last few decades and is now enormous. So this rise of China shows that democratic processes and open markets are not prerequisites for economic growth. That is this success of China threatens the western model of democracy and this is where Taiwan comes in. because taiwan has a vibrant democracy so if china recaptures taiwan and it starts imposing its uh, one party government there also then this will be a major setback to the liberal world order and usa doesn't want this this is why usa is favoring an independent democratic taiwan through its back channel to counter chinese ideology there is also another reason for usa support to taiwan this is to contain china militarily See if China captures Taiwan then Taiwan will be acting as a forward base for China. This will increase Chinese aircraft and missile ranges to another 150 nautical miles to the east. This is a problem for US because this increase in range will give the Chinese upper hand in the region and this will be detrimental to US Pacific Island territory which is Guam and it will be also detrimental to the US ally which is Japan and USA doesn't want this also. And next comes the economic reason. We all know China is a global manufacturing giant. Even then, China lacks several latest technologies, especially in the area of semiconductors. 
in the semiconductor sector china is dependent on taiwan so that means if china captures taiwan then it will also get hold of these technologies and this will give a much needed boost to the chinese economy and then it will lead to toppling of usa from being the global economic superpower and obviously usa doesn't want this also so due to these reasons usa wants taiwan to remain independent and democratic and not under the control of china but officially still their stand is one china policy only but the visit of ms pelosi to taiwan may have made a crack in this official stand so now let us see the impacts of ms pelosi's visit so on one hand the taiwanese officials welcomed her visit because it will give a boost to their global standing but the chinese government was furious actually even during the planning stages of this visit chinese government opposed it and even gave out a stern warning message why because china sees this visit by the speaker of house of representatives of usa as a political move but we said that under the one china policy usa has already promised it will not engage in any official relations with taiwan so now china feels that usa is backtracking on its promise and it is trying to change the status quo so china just did not uh, give out a stern warning rather it also responded militarily politically and economically so militarily china responded by conducting live drills around taiwan yes around taiwan take a look at this map here you can see the uh, taiwan's maritime border in the dotted line and the green one is the taiwan's territorial waters now the pink markings are the regions where china conducted live military drills you can clearly see that it is around taiwan china even fired conventional missiles over the island of taiwan into the waters to the east so what china was aiming to achieve through this it wanted to show taiwan what will happen in the future and how it can create a economic blockage along with this china also announced that it will cancel or suspend eight key dialogue mechanisms with the usa and this included three important bilateral military dialogues also so this was the military response of china now politically china took some steps to censure the us action here china suspended bilateral talks on key matters such as uh, climate change repatriation of illegal immigrants legal assistance in criminal matters transnational crimes etc but if you see economically the response was minimal it just imposed some curbs on taiwanese exports why because as i already said china is the one which is heavily dependent on taiwanese semiconductors so it just cannot impose uh, curbs on all the exports from taiwan it will be affecting chinese economy also So these were the major impacts of Ms Nancy Pelosi's visit and uh, China's response. But remember, here both the Chinese actions and the action by USA are mainly due to the domestic political developments. See on 3rd August itself we saw the domestic reasons that fueled the Chinese actions and today we'll be focusing on the domestic reasons that fueled USA's actions. Here you should understand that USA's polity is different from India. In India the executive is a part of the legislature but in the USA executive and the legislature are distinct so president biden and the white house represent the uh, executive whereas ms pelosi and the house of representatives will be denoting the legislature this shows that white house has a minimal control over the house of representatives and this is why mr joe biden distance himself and also the white house from ms pelosi's visit He even advised Ms Pelosi to not make the visit but even then the visit happened and this is due to the local politics of USA let me tell you briefly why since the recent times anti china sentiment has been growing among americans some recent polls even suggest that 82 percentage of americans have a negative view of china and some of them even want to recognize taiwan as an independent nation now these points are relevant in the local politics of usa because the current party which is in power has failed to deliver on its promise it has failed to pass uh, medicare for all act it even is dealing with uh, inflation and high gasoline prices so at this juncture the midterm elections for the house of representatives is coming so they fear that they will not be winning this election if the current situation goes on and that is why at this moment it is easier for the government to project toughness against china and they are aiming to get brownie points from the people that are actually delivering on the promises it made during the election so the visit of ms nancy pelosi is mainly aimed at exploiting the anti chinese sentiments of the us citizens 
so that her party can continue to hold majority in the house of representatives so in short the entire saga of both uh, china and usa acting on the taiwan issue is just their own selfish domestic needs that is why even uh, in the international relations video that was published today in our channel which is taken by tp shrinivasan sir he said that taiwan issue will not develop into a full blown war because war will be detrimental to both the countries of china as well as usa but we cannot also deny the fact that this episode will definitely weaken the sino us relationship okay because as i already said the visit of ms nancy pelosi shows a crack in the one china policy of usa so i hope you understood what is happening in the world politics and how they are exploiting the situation for their own personal gains with these points in mind now let us get to the next discussion this discussion is going to be based on this snippet article from the science page it says that a pioneering gene therapy has used crispr cas9 genome editing see this therapy has used this genome editing to target the root cause of sickle cell disease as you know sickle cell disease is caused by a flaw in the body's oxygen carrying protein you know which one is the oxygen carrying protein yes it is hemoglobin so flaw in hemoglobin causes the sickle cell disease and through genome editing the therapy has targeted the root cause of this disease see actually in the recent years genomics and research and development in this field is one of the favorites of upsc especially in the preliminary examination and that is why we'll be focusing on crispr cas9 genome editing but before seeing about this tool we'll be seeing about what is genome editing it is also called as gene editing it involves a group of technology that gives the ability to change an organism's dna that is it allows us to edit the dna of an organism now when you say edit it means you can add something you can remove something you can alter something like that using the genome editing technologies genetic material can be added removed or altered at particular locations in the genome so several approaches have been developed uh, in genome editing and a well known one is the crispr cas9 approach so crispr cas9 is a approach or a tool that is used in gene editing here crispr stands for clustered regularly interspaced short palindromic repeats and then cas9 stands for crispr associated protein 9 now in the recent times many of the genome editing involves crispr cas9 approach why because it is faster cheaper more accurate and it is also more efficient than other genome editing methods but why do we need such genome editing it is because genome editing allows for the targeted intervention at the genomic sequence now what is this uh, targeted intervention it means you can insert remove or even alter a particular gene in the entire sequence so the genome editing tools have opened various possibilities especially in the plant breeding and nowadays using this tool agricultural scientists are able to insert specific traits in the gene sequence and this could involve you know drought resistant genes genes showing uh, insect repellent traits etc here you may think that we already know about genetically modified organisms gmos see this gmo is different from the crispr cas9 gene editing let me tell you how gmos involve modification of genetic material of the host by introduction of a foreign genetic material here focus on the term foreign genetic material that is the genetic material from a foreign organism is introduced into the genetic material of the host with the help of cotton let us understand how this happens see cotton is affected by one of the most destructive pests called as pink bollworm so to solve this problem scientists introduced genes CRY1AC and CRY2AB into the genes of cotton plant see these two genes are mined from the soil bacterium which is the soil bacterium here it is the bacillus thuringiensis in short bt that is why we call this as bt cotton now the introduction of these genes allows the native cotton plant to generate endotoxins this endotoxin helps the cotton plant to fight the pink bollworm naturally so in this way a modification in the gene of the cotton plant has helped it to survive but understand here bt is a different organism and cotton plant is a different species so two genes from bt has been transferred to the cotton plant so these two genes are the genes from a foreign organism 
and this is called as the genetic engineering so the basic difference between crispr cas9 genome editing and genetic engineering is that crispr cas9 does not involve the introduction of a foreign genetic material into the host but on the other hand as we just saw genetic engineering involves the introduction of foreign genetic material into the host okay but what you have to remember is both these techniques involves editing of genes and both of them aim to generate variants in such a way that such a variant will be uh, providing a better yield and will be more resistant to biotic and abiotic stress now even before gene editing there were other methods through which crop damages were prevented like they were uh, doing the selective breeding and all see the selective breeding involved carefully crossing the plants that had the specific traits to produce the desired trait in the offspring for example if a particular plant is resistant to a pest then that plant will be crossed with a similar variety of the same species so from this they obtained other plants that were resistant to that pest but the problem is you cannot be sure about the result here you cannot ensure that all the offsprings that we get from this crossing will be resistant to pests some of them will not be showing the resistance and that is why now the genome editing and genetic engineering has gained prominence because these processes have become more accurate and they have also allowed the scientists to have greater control on trait development because they can choose the particular trait which they want to modify now let us come to the crispr cas9 this crispr cas9 was adapted from a naturally occurring genome editing system that is present in bacteria the bacteria uses this natural genome editing system as an uh, immune defense what happens is when bacteria gets infected with viruses it captures small pieces of the virus's dna and then they insert them into their own dna in a particular pattern to create segments known as crispr arrays now these crispr arrays allows the bacteria to remember the viruses they remember it because if the virus attacks again then the bacteria will be producing rna segments from the crispr arrays that recognize and attach to specific regions of the virus's dna then the bacteria uses cas9 or a similar kind of enzyme to cut the dna apart and through this it disables the virus so after knowing this process researchers also adapted this immune defense system to edit dnas here what they do is they create a small piece of rna for guidance this is similar to rna segments that the bacteria produced from the crispr arrays now when these are introduced into the cells the guide rna recognizes the intended dna sequence and then it attaches itself to a specific target sequence in a cell's dna and it also attaches to the cas9 enzyme and here the cas9 enzyme cuts the dna at the targeted location like what happened in the bacteria case you also remember that even other enzymes other than uh, cas9 can also be used in this process now once the dna is cut the researchers use the cells own dna repair machinery to add pieces of genetic material or even to delete them they can also use the same to make changes to the dna by replacing an existing segment with a customized dna sequence so here whatever they are doing is with the existing dna of the host a foreign gene is not introduced here okay So this is how the CRISPR Cas9 technology works. So with these points in mind, let us get to the next discussion. Let us take up this news article. What it says: Out of the total offset commitment to be fulfilled by foreign defense companies, only 82.13 percentage has been fulfilled. So that means more than 17 percentage of offset commitment remains unfulfilled. And because of this, now the Minister of State for Defense has said that the penalty for this will be levied on the defaulters according to the Defense Offset Guidelines. So to understand what is this defense offset and what is this policy regarding this, we need to know about defense procurement procedure also. First, let us start with defense offset. See, as you know. India imports defense equipment from a foreign country. That means a foreign firm is exporting its defense equipments. Now, while doing so, that foreign firm is obligated to boost India's domestic defense industry. Now, here this obligation is what we call as the defense offset. Now, this obligation is in terms of percentage of the total imports. Okay, but why this is done? This is because defense contracts are costly. So for a country like India which heavily depends on imports for most of its military hardware defense imports can strain its foreign exchange reserves 
that is why defense offset has been proposed and it has three main objectives first is to partially compensate for the significant outflow of forex reserves second is to facilitate technology transfers third is to add capacities and capabilities of domestic industry so that means through defense offsets forex reserves are saved we get technology transfer and our domestic industry is developed and note that this defense offset policy in india is implemented through the defense procurement procedure in short dpp see this dpp contains policies and procedures for military hardware procurement and acquisition now the main aim of such dpp is to ensure the time bound defense procurement process and faster decision making like i said this dpp enforces the defense offset policy also so the main aim of defense procurement procedure is to make india a global defense manufacturing hub now according to the dpp of 2005 if the defense procurements are over 300 crores then 30 percentage of it will result in offsets and this will be implemented through the indian offset partners here the offset partners are mostly the indian micro small and medium enterprises that is msmes but remember this dpp was revised in 2016 and this limit of 300 crores was also increased it was increased to 2000 crores and then later in the year 2020 the dpp was rechristened it is now called as the defense acquisition procedure of 2020 now this dap or defense acquisition procedure brought a major change to the offset policy this change was now there is no need for the defense offset in case of certain procurements this includes government to government procurement single vendor procurements and defense procurements under intergovernmental agreements so that means deals like rafale need not adhere to the offset clause so from this discussion you would have got an idea like this defense offset is similar to the csr that is corporate social responsibility of indian companies like they are also the companies are by law required to voluntarily contribute a percentage of their profits for social development so like this the foreign defense firms who are exporting defense equipment to india are required to spend to boost indian domestic defense sector this is the point that you have to remember so with these points in mind we are going to the next discussion we have come to the last discussion for today which is based on this news article it says that indian virtual herbarium was established with details of about 1 lakh plant specimens so regarding this herbarium even our prime minister has noted that it is an example of how digital tools can help us connect to our roots so this topic becomes important from the problems angle that is why we are going to cover indian virtual herbarium today So it is the country's largest online herbarium database and it is a web portal. It was inaugurated by the Union Environment Minister on 1st of July. So what is this herbarium? It is actually a collection of plant samples with associated data for long term study. These materials may include pressed and mounted plants, seeds, dry fruits, wood sections, pollen, microscope slides, silica stored materials, frozen DNA extractions, fluid preserved flowers or fruits etc. So all these materials are generally referred as herbarium specimens. Now this uh, portal of uh, Indian virtual herbarium has been developed by the Botanical Survey of India under the framework of Azadi ka Amrit Mahotsav and Digital India. It is actually a database of dried plants. it contains uh, digital images of herbarium specimens apart from this the label on the data of each species includes uh, crucial informations uh, about the specimens such as their family genus species author citation subspecies etc and as i said in the beginning this herbarium contains more than 1 lakh specimens and scientific information about the plants it also includes details about medicinal plants and herbs but why it is important See this portal aims to provide complete information on herbarium specimens about floral diversity of India through online access. So this will aid in the research studies of Indian flora and it will provide valuable insight for global plant research. And also know that this IVH is deeply linked with the botanical history of our country because uh, the portal provides most valuable historical collections of uh, certain botanists who are considered to be the founding fathers of botany in india who are they they are the william roxborough nathaniel wallick and joseph dalton hooker 
Other than this, the digital herbarium also includes features to extract the data state-wise. So that means users can search plants of their own states. It will help them to identify regional plants and they can uh, build regional checklists. So it is one of the crucial development under Digital India platform and it will be providing boost to the global plant research. So these are the few facts that you have to know about uh, Indian Virtual Herbarium. This topic was quite factual. You have to remember the meaning of herbarium and what this database is about and what collections it has and its significance. So with these crucial points, we are moving to the last session of the day, which is the practice questions discussion session. This is the first question. It is a three statement question. Consider the following statements regarding Chipko movement. First statement is, it is a violent movement of 1973 to conserve trees in the Himalayan districts of Uttar Pradesh. Now from the school days, you would have heard about Chipko movement and you know that it is a movement to conserve trees. But note that it was not a violent movement, rather it is a non-violent agitation. This Chipko movement, which was a non-violent agitation, happened in 1973. It was aimed at protection and conservation of trees. See, the uprising was against the felling of trees and to maintain the ecological balance and this movement originated in Uttar Pradesh's Chamoli district in 1973 and soon after it also spread to other states in North India. Actually here the term Chipko means embrace. So the villagers hugged the trees and encircled them to prevent them from being felled. So first statement is incorrect. Come to the second statement. During the movement the villagers embraced the trees to prevent them from being cutting down. This is correct. Just now I told that in the Chipko movement, the villagers embraced the trees. Come to the third statement. Bishnoi movement is based on Chipko movement. See, for a movement to be based on another movement, first it has to be happened before that, right? But we know that Chipko happened in 1973, but Bishnoi movement happened in 1730s itself. So we can say Chipko movement was based on Bishnoi, not the other way around. So this statement is also incorrect. And here the question asks you to choose the correct statements. Therefore, the correct answer is option B, 2 only. Now, let me take the second question. Consider the following statements regarding genome editing. Two statements are given. First statement, changes introduced to germline cells through genome editing are passed on to the next generation. See, germline cells are the egg cells or sperm cells. Okay. Now, it says through genome editing, the changes will be passed on to next generation. This statement is actually correct. You have to understand that most of the changes which are introduced with genome editing are limited to somatic cells. The somatic cells are the cells other than the germline cells. So the changes are isolated to only certain issues and they are not passed from one generation to the next generation in case of somatic cells. But the changes which are made to the germline cells, which are the egg cells or sperm cells or to the genes of an embryo, this could be passed to future generations. You should note that the germline cell editing and uh, embryo genome editing bring up a number of ethical changes. It is still a question whether it would be permissible to use this technology to enhance normal human traits or not because the changes will be passed on to the next generation. So as of now, changes to the somatic cells are permitted. So statement one is correct. Statement two, genome editing holds promise for the treatment of disorders such as cystic fibrosis, hemophilia, sickle cell disease. This is also correct. See, this is the actual application of genome editing. Currently, genome editing is used in cells and animal models in research labs to understand diseases. And it is also being explored in research and clinical trials for a wide variety of diseases. This includes single gene disorders such as cystic fibrosis, hemophilia and sickle cell disease. Also know that it also holds promise for the treatment and prevention of more complex diseases such as cancer, heart disease, HIV infection, etc. So here both the statements are correct and the question also asks you to choose the correct statements. So the correct answer is option C both 1 and 2. Now come to the next question. It is a two statement question. First statement, Central National Herbarium located at Howrah is the only herbarium in the country. This is incorrect because there are also other major herbaria in India. First, if you see the Central National Herbarium, it is located in Kolkata. 
It was established in 1795 and it comprises about 2 million specimens. And this is the first herbarium in the country and one of the most important Asian herbaria. Next, we also have the Forest Research Institute. It is situated in Dehradun. It contains uh, more than 3,50,000 specimens. And next comes the National Botanic Gardens. And then we have the Blatter Herbarium. And we also have the Botanical Survey of India because it also has a herbaria attached to their regional centers. So, CNH is not the only herbarium in the country. First statement is incorrect. Second statement. Botanical Survey of India functions under the Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change. This statement is correct. Actually, Botanical Survey of India is an attached office of this ministry. It was established in 1890. Now here, be careful. The question asks you to choose the incorrect statements. So the correct answer is option A, one only. Let me take the next question. Consider the following statements about Defense Acquisition Council. First statement, it is headed by the Prime Minister. It is incorrect because the DAC is headed by the Union Defense Minister not the Prime Minister. Keep this fact in mind, you may get confused in the prelims examination. Second statement, the council decides on new policies and capital acquisitions for the three services and the Indian Coast Guard. Now you will be sure that it decides new policies and capital acquisitions for the three services, but you will be doubtful about Indian Coast Guard. Actually, the statement is correct. It also decides on these matters regarding Indian Coast Guard also. See, actually, during discussion, we saw about defense offset, right? Now, this percentage of defense offset will also be decided by this council only. Now, the 30 percentage offset limit provided in DPP is just the lower limit, whereas the council has the powers to set a higher offset also if it finds there is a need for it. So, here, statement 1 is incorrect, statement 2 is correct, and the question asks you to choose the correct statements only. So, the correct answer is option B, 2 only. Now, the quiz question for today will be published as a poll. I think after listening to this video, you can easily attend the poll. The answer for the poll question will be published in tomorrow's video. Now, let me take the mains question. In the context of recent visit by Ms. Nancy Pelosi to Taiwan, elaborate on why Taiwan is significant for both China and USA. Now, you need not focus on the visit majorly because the question is about the significance of Taiwan to China and USA. You can just mention about the visit in two lines, two to three lines. Because it signifies a political visit from the side of USA to Taiwan. Now, why Taiwan is significant for China was discussed on 3rd August also. And we discussed some of the points today also. Along with that, why it is significant for US was also discussed in today's discussion. And the major point is to counter China militarily, economically and politically. Okay. You can use the points that we discussed in the discussion. And if you find any other points relevant to this question, don't forget to add that also. But remember, you have to answer it in 150 words. So be precise and accurate. Interested aspirants can write answer to this question and post it in the comment section. So with this question, we have come to the end of uh, Hindi News Analysis for uh, 7th of August. If you like this video, don't forget to click the like button. You can share your experience and suggestions in the comment section. And those who have not subscribed yet, subscribe to the channel of Shankarais Academy to keep yourselves updated with current affairs. Thank you.